So today we're continuing and hopefully going to finish. I think we will finish chapter seven. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about splines. That's where we left off last time. So previously we had discussed um, what in the book are called regression splines, where you divide up the range of a independent variable and you create separate separate functions, usually polynomial functions, cubic polynomials uh, over its range in different parts of its range. And uh, today we're gonna move on to smoothing splines, which is kind of, uh, kind of magic. And uh, I can't say that I have grokked them, um, but uh, I'll present what I what I have come to understand. So, <clears throat> uh, the general strategy for smoothing, or, sorry, sorry for regression splines, as I mentioned, was to specify knots, which are the cut points, uh, and then you have basis functions uh, over the range, and then you can use even just ordinary least squares to fit the model. Now, with smoothing splines, what you do is something that is, I think maybe, well, in some ways it's counterintuitive, in some ways it's, it's actually something of an old hat for us. So you'll see that the second bullet point on this uh, kind of ugly R markdown output is, um, so we're minimizing something, right? And we're minimizing um, just uh, to spoil it, you know, that, that first part, uh, the summation is a, a loss function and it's just minimizing the squared residuals. So that's, you know, minimizing RSS. That's something that uh, is, is pretty standard. But um, we're also trying to minimize the following. We're trying to minimize this it's the integral of the second derivative of the function g that we're trying to fit. So that's kind of that's the new that's the new part. Um, as far as I know, nowhere in this book before and nowhere else that I'm aware of in uh, machine learning do you uh, minimize second derivatives of functions, but if you think about it, <clears throat> um, it, it makes some amount of sense. So um, you think of, um, I'm actually gonna skip ahead to uh, this bullet point that I'm highlighting, which is, so that's just the second term with the, that lambda is like a coefficient, it's like a tuning parameter, but the, what it's you know, multiplying, what it's scaling, is uh, this integral. And the way to think about it is the sum total of roughness or wiggliness of your function, right? So obviously, uh, not obviously, but a straight line has no roughness or wiggliness. The second derivative of any straight line is, is zero. So anytime that it starts to move around and it starts to wiggle, right? It has something under the integral, the second derivative. So once you know that sort of impressionistic realization like gets lodged in your brain, it becomes a pretty cool, you know, it, was, it must have been a pretty smart cookie, whoever uh, came up with that. One thing that uh, this is the part that I really haven't grokked is what I have in the quotation marks and it's the fourth um, bullet point, which is that the result of this is a smoothing spline that, uh, or sorry, is a natural cubic spline with knots at every unique value of the independent variable. And that's pretty wild, that that's what you get out of that. And that's the part that I, uh, I just take on faith. Um, one thing that'll come up in a second is that you might say, you might remember that um, degrees of freedom, uh, so flexibility of the model was, determined by the number of knots. 
uh, in, in the previous in regression splines. So you might think, I mean, just how are you not just overfitting? You know, how are you not taking up all the degrees of freedom with by having a not an every unique value of the independent variable? And it's because of this, this lambda, you have some shrinkage going on. And as usual, as usual, when you have a, a shrinkage parameter, it's good to kind of imagine the extreme cases. So um, now I'm looking at the second, the penultimate bullet point. When lambda goes to zero, so when, um, yeah, so when lambda goes to zero, you basically uh, just get interpolation. You just get a function that uh, will just go through every unique value of x, where there's a unique value of the independent variable. Yeah, um, quick question, just yeah. the, the lambda parameter here and, and that fourth bullet point, and this is maybe not fair because you already said you're not quite sure about that fourth bullet point, but in a natural cubic spline, is there a counterpart to the lambda parameter? And if not, uh, then which value of lambda actually corresponds to that cubic spline? So, Okay, let me think. So, the, so there are two questions there. Uh, one is what determines, okay, so if, I'm, if memory doesn't fail me and my understanding didn't fail me originally, then degrees of freedom is just mechanically set by the number of cut points in a, as, for example, in a, a natural spline or a non-natural spline. You just choose the number of knots. You probably by default will say cubic, and then mm -hmm. just mechanically you can calculate the number of degrees of freedom. And I didn't remember a lambda parameter in that, but I could have been mistaken. Right, and so so there is responding to that. So 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 there is no uh, there is no lambda parameter there. I think your memory is correct. Is a, a shorter way of what I'm trying to say. And then to your to your second question, um, what lambda corresponds to uh so, so in this this formula the smoothing spline formula what lambda corresponds to a natural cubic spline uh i think it's any any value of lambda will like technically be a natural cubic spline but with some like i think you can apply different levels of shrinkage and still get a natural cubic spline is what i'm trying to say so so it seems then that the idea of a natural cubic spline is a as a family that's dialed by lambda here. But if we just did a natural cubic spline as a natural cubic spline, then how would we dial through that family? You, you would uh, choose the number of cut points. So, that so if we, but if we took cut points, like maybe, maybe I'm misunderstanding here. If we took the cut points at every unique value of like every data point. Yeah. Is that, so okay okay i think i i see what you're saying so so yeah so if we did the the old way yeah of, of not trying to minimize this second or the integral of the second derivative then that would correspond to having a lambda of zero in this uh in this equation because there's no there's no as you said as you remember correctly there's no lambda penalty there so does that does that make? Uh, I mean, yeah. If, I mean, yeah. So that's I guess that's my question. Like, what value of lambda would correspond to and has that limit of a natural cubic spline? And you're saying zero. So it's actually a lambda of zero would be not doing the smoothing at all. Yeah. So a smoothing spline is a smoothing spline. Sorry, is a a generalization of a natural cubic spline. It sounds like what you're saying now. Yes. I mean, as uh, well, I mean, you can think of it. I'm trying to think. Um, yeah, it's a shrunken. It's a shrunken version. Uh, it's one of the ways that I have come to think about it is it's a nice way of avoiding setting any cut points. So assume you don't have any a priori or any ex ante reason to set cut points at certain places, but you maybe think the wiggliness of your function isn't um constant across its range right then th so okay if you don't think it's constant across its range then you might not want to put equally spaced knots um and you're 
the smoothing spine would figure that out for you. So, uh, I mean, that's not, that's not getting to its essence. That's, that's much more of a practical comment, but, uh, but I'm throwing it out there. And also I heard some chatter. I think Laura, you were saying something. Yeah. To say something. Yeah. This is a minor point, but I know you have, and obviously you could think of Lambda as like positive or negative, but you have minus Lambda term. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's plus Lambda. So that might, um, in terms of how we think about what's okay, being minimized, you, you want to minimize change it, right? things. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, okay. if we're going to be consistent with the book notation, not that we couldn't use the way you have it, if we defined lambda more in terms of negative or approaching negative infinity, but that's just something that came to my mind when I was looking at it. And maybe you had a reason, Justin, for using negative um, in terms of how you're thinking about it versus adding the lambda term. I'd be uh, curious to hear no. that. No, I think you're attributing too much intelligence to me there. Um, I, I did not intentionally, that, that, that was just, you know, the inevitable result of me um, writing LaTeX from a book, from trying to do it from uh, looking at one tab, like, or, you know, looking at one screen, looking at another screen. So that, that's a typo. And I appreciate that you caught that. And I oh, appreciate yeah, no, that you no. thought I maybe did it on purpose. <laughs> No, I did. I didn't know. I and obviously, I know somebody who also. When you do LaTeX, there's a lot of <laughs> potential to, you know, accidentally type something. But I just wanted to make sure that uh, I had a understanding of where you were going with it. Yeah. No. You, yeah. You are trying to. Right. Never mind. So. So yes. Yes. You would want to add that because you're trying to minimize uh, the the wiggliness of the function. It's like the the penalty. I mean, yeah. Um, uh, sorry, Justin. Can I just can I can I say something? Of course. Um, maybe that. Uh, oh, sorry. I just need to uh, speak a bit. Um, so, so um, this this value g here uh, maybe is a bit confusing because if you had put like f uh, instead of g, general g. That, that would have been more clear because uh, this is the difference between the prediction and the uh, observed function, uh, uh, the function of the observed values. So, so the difference of these two are the residuals that you exponentiate to, uh, in, to two and then you summarize them all and then you adapt it to with a sort of like um, <clears throat> what it, it, this is a slope, a sort of slope, and then uh, the, the rest of the things that it, it's, I, I really like this roughness um, on weaknesses, uh, which really gives the idea about what actually does, uh, because it's a setting the things around the points that you. That, that, that's the thing that you want to do, no? You want to set uh, a smooth clean, uh, line that will be able to catch most of your points. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so, so if I understood. This G, yeah, uh -huh. this G is just an F. And that would, would have more, just give you visually uh, the better the idea of what, what is it? Yeah, so, so, so G is just uh, a function. Uh, that's right. So uh, again, this was me. This is not me making a mistake, but it is me just copying what they had in the book. Uh, if anyone has a theory as to why they chose G of X as opposed to F of X, that would be interesting. I know that just or from memory, G of X is like the second most common way to write a function of x, but it's second. Um, it's a distant uh, it's second. Because, uh, yeah, it's because they usually say that g is dominated by uh, by f or vice versa. So g is just another uh, like a variation, di different kind of function of, from f. But uh, the meaning in this context is always it's, it's f. So it's the right. function of our uh, observations. Then we have uh, made a prediction and we catch the difference between these two to have the, the residuals. 
no? So the difference between, between and then we assess, assess the, the thing around. But I, I'm, I'm not sure um, this, uh, so this is the thing. Um, the G uh, can be named G as G because it uh, maybe the F is slightly different from the original one because with a sort of modification, but I'm not sure about that. Yeah. I'm not sure either. Yeah. Quick question. Uh -huh. Oh, so yeah. I, I feel like we're probably getting too hung up on this, I know. But t the T variable in the integral, is that more, it's not really a variable, it's more thinking about it like at a certain point. I mean, it's, I'm going to be honest, it's been like over 10 years since I've had Calc 2. So <laughs> I'm probably a little bit uh, rusty on this. But it's, is it, I mean, I guess it's DT, so it's going to be a variable. How do we think? about that t as opposed to the x it's like rate of change or uh i, I was so, looking back at the book and i didn't find a clear explanation but i might have missed it yeah i mean it's just the way um again so why they chose t is an interesting uh question i don't know if someone had talked to more recently they or if someone just is you know calc mastermind feel free to answer but i mean that term just is the integral of the second derivative across the entire range of the, that variable. Um, perhaps they chose T to just really separate it out from Xi, like as sep, you know, each individual um, value of that variable. Like, um, I'm trying to think, you know, what other letter they could have uh, chosen, maybe a capital X. No, maybe a lowercase x with no subscript. Um, that makes you know. Sense. I could see the lowercase x with no subscript. Um, I just, maybe I'm reading too much into this, but like I said, I'm just trying to kind of like wrap my head. I think like you were trying to do as well, conceptually, like what are we? And I get the roughness, wiggliness, but like, you know, going a little bit, you know, deeper into, I guess, what it is getting at. I, I also found the change in variable um, very confusing, but it is a valid point of, you know, like they, they don't j use just X, I guess, or I don't know. Um, but I think if we just kind of accept it, <laughs> yeah, it, it works. Probably. <laughs> yeah. I, know, I, I have a feeling we're kind of getting into me a little more, yeah. you know, if we were doing elements of statistical learning, maybe this would right. uh, be a more worthwhile conversation. So. Uh, no, it's a very worthwhile conversation. I think it's worthwhile to understand what the equation is showing. Like, don't just gloss over, you know, um, just accept it and move on. It's good to actually understand it. So thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think the next slide is a, uh, well, not really a slide. If you imagine it as a slide, it's, it's going to, there's going to be more hand waving happening here than even on the previous one. So I see no sun voodoo, because to me, this is just wild. Uh, so when you fit this, when you perform this minimization, you end up getting uh, this matrix. So there's this S sub lambda, right? Because each version of lambda will give you different values, uh, will give you different wiggliness or different roughness. Um, but so, so you get this in by n, where n is the number of observations, you get this n by n uh, matrix. And to me, th this is the part that just blows my mind, um, just coming from you know generalized linear models, that your predicted values, so that's the g hat, so we're, we're, sorry Federico, we're still using g, <laughs> we're still using g. Um, so your predicted values are actually, you know, a trick, uh, uh, well, it could be a you know, translation of the original observed values. And that to me is just, uh, oof. So anyway, that's what this, this y is. That's the vector of your observed values. And to me, that's, uh, that's pretty crazy. So anyways, I just put that in there. Just to, I don't have any, anyway. <clears throat> um, 
They also talk about effective just, degree. Just, just, just in a, um, um, sorry, because I made a mistake with this, um, with this, this, but um, it doesn't matter uh, if uh, if I do the prediction uh, minus the observed one or vice versa because I square them, so that's fine. But you, you, um, the, the the thing I, I do when. Um, I read these things it to, is to visualize, you know, what what I'm doing uh, in simple uh, ways. And so just reduce the the, um, the 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 amount of the problem to uh, a very simple problem, and then uh, you how can you explain to the others? So you use symbols to to say that there is a difference. No, from from this value, which is the predicted one, and the observed one. So you yes. you have a sort of uh, yeah you you um, have a, an element which is on top of the other, and for explaining the others uh, to to make the others understanding of this manipulation, you need to use uh, an element that you. That you add. I'm I'm talking about this G hat equals to S lambda. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, when when you do the calculation, you understand you understand everything. But when you need to explain to the others, you need to add a, a symbol for let the other understand what what did you do. If if you if I use a double hat, for example, on both sides of this equation, that, that won't be such as clear as if I say I have uh, made an addition to, to this element. So this S is like uh, makes you understanding what that there is an element which is used this used this way within this function with this. This modification implies an element which is multiplied with the function uh, the, of the observed values in this in this contest. But uh, we might go out of the tangent. <laughs> uh, so let's say yeah, it, it, um... yeah. I'm trying to understand. Is your point a general point about pedagogy, or is it about this equation in particular? Um, so, no. um, maybe it, just the understanding of the equation and what is this S means. Uh, Okay. Uh, yeah. No. I mean, I'm I'm trying to to preface this this entire. I mean, I, I called it notes on voodoo because I'm not going to explain. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm not since I myself don't understand sort of the the magic of smoothing splines. I realize going into this that I'm not going to be able to convey more than I myself understand. Um, I'm not hoping for a miracle on this Tuesday morning. Um, I, I'm so so with this slide, which I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to try to go through quickly. Now, uh, my point was just to convey that this S is a matrix um, that will transform the observed output values to the predicted values, which is um, is something that has come up in the book before, I forget exactly where, that there's this similar way of arriving at. So as opposed to taking the model, so I guess what I could say is, why am I surprised by this? Um, I think other people might be as well, just because normally you have the model matrix, so all your regressors plus an intercept, you multiply that by a vector of fit, fitted parameters, and that's how you get your um, your predicted values. That's, I, I don't know what percentage, but in the vast majority of, of machine learning models, that's how that, how that goes. And here, and this is like the mind blowing part, that we perform this minimization, we get this mysterious to me, this voodoo, this magic in by in S 
matrix, you multiply the actual observed values by that. And that's how you get these predicted values. So that's really all I'm trying to convey. Uh, that, that to me is, is pretty wild. Uh, and, um, and that's about it. <laughs> so, so, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I guess I could have put, you know, S is a, a member of N by N matrices, Y is a, a N by one column vector, and G hat is an N by one column vector, but um, I had hoped to do that in words. Anyway, but I, I do want to, I do want to move on from that. And, um, and so, so I'm going to go through the, <laughs> I'll do an even worse job presenting the, the next two lines. Uh, so again, this is, these are things that I'm just going to say that to me seemed uh, interesting, but I don't have any more profound ways of, of understanding them. Um, so the, the next line ad addresses this um, effective degrees of freedom point. So again, you think that there's, or one might think, or sort of at first blush, there's uh, a knot at every unique value of, of x, the, the, the regressor. Um, and you might think that that will just give you the degrees of freedom. And it does give you the nominal degrees of freedom. But um, to calculate what they call the effective degrees of freedom, which is how rough or wiggly the line actually is, uh, yeah, um, you actually calculate what's for, well, OK, what this is is the sum of the diagonal elements of this n by n matrix. Uh, and from linear algebra days, one might remember that that's called the trace of, uh, of that matrix. So again, I don't have any profound things to say about that, but you take the trace of this, this matrix um, and you get the effective degrees of freedom. And then the last thing, and this, all, this, this is uh, again, appeared somewhere else in the book, or what I mean is that some other model had a similar, um, I think it might have been, it might have been the, the lasso, in any case, um, where there's something that looks like an analytical solution to, to leave one out uh, cross validation error. So that's what this is. Um, this is the, the formula for leave one out cross validation. Um, so, by the way, uh, Sham, your your microphone's on. Just so you know. Um, so, um, what you see in the uh, so the middle of of it is how you would just write out again using G instead of F. Um, how how you would calculate leave one out cross validation is that you take the ith observation, fit the model on everything but the ith observation. That's what that minus one is uh, the minus one superscript on the G. And then you get the squared residual and then you sum those up for every possible, for every row in your data. And then this is to me, again, a mind blowing part that I don't have any fundamental insight into um, is that one sort of analytical solution for that is that you, um, you can, I think it might've been helpful to put, I, I basically just did what they had in the book, but notice that the top again, is the sum of squared residuals. Well, OK, no. It is a squared residual uh, for the model fed on all the data. And then you divide that by that row's diagonal element. So well, 1 minus that row's diagonal element squared. So again, I can't derive that formula to show where it comes from. Um, but just these kinds of things are things I find interesting. All right, so <clears throat> it is now past 9.30, so I'm uh, very cognizant of time. Um, this is from actually the, the lab. So uh, earlier I mentioned, I think last week, no, in Slack, I mentioned this, we'll try to incorporate the lab into this. And so that's what I'm doing now. And this is actually a figure from the book uh, that they later in the lab show how to make. Um, and, uh, you know, this is kind of what you expect. So you see fewer degrees of freedom, gives you this blue line. Uh, and, you know, it's, it curves, but I wouldn't say it's like wiggly, right? Uh, whereas this this uh, red line is quite is writhing quite a bit. And if you look, um, so how would these two lines fit? Uh, so so first of all, you have smooth dot spline as the function, uh, and it's 
I believe just part of um, R, like you don't have to download a package for that. Um, you have um, age, wage, so it has this X, Y. Um, uh, so it's not a formula, but uh, you have if you're your independent variable, your dependent variable, and then you can either specify degrees of freedom. So that's how they got this really wiggly 16 degrees of freedom line, or you can use cross validation. Um, leave one out cross validation uh, to get the line. And one thing that I found interesting uh, is if uh, they don't mention this in the lab, but if you actually run the code that they give you, you get this error. Cross validation with non unique X seems doubtful, <laughs> which I thought was uh, for some reason I just laughed at that and it was funny. Um, and I believe that it's because they use uh, leave one out cross validation. And I never thought about that before that non unique values of X make leave one out cross validation seem doubtful. That's not something they had mentioned earlier in the book. And uh, it's something that I'll have to maybe think about later, depending on how important I think that is. Uh, and then just from the, uh, this is really just um, the same thing uh, in the documentation for the smooth out spline function in the book. Uh, they do basically the, the same thing, uh, just using the, the cars data. Um, they use cross validation to give you, uh, to give us this blue line. And one thing I did want to say that's interesting about it that I've um, read elsewhere is in, in practicing this is that typically when you do GAMs, generalized additive models, uh, you'll use smoothing splines. And it's not typical to use just a linear function in those that you'll actually try to, you'll use splines and you'll use cross validation on a spline. And if, the true relationship between X and Y is linear, then cross-validation will discover that. So I found that to be kind of an interesting thing. Uh, uh, and here you can see indeed that the line that gets that ends up getting fit uh, well, is, is fairly linear. But we'll come to uh, hypothesis testing, hopefully, uh, for that in a second. OK, uh, local regression. First, any questions? It's been a while since someone else has talked. No, all right. All right, so those were uh, smooth splines. Uh, local regression is much less voodoo. I feel much more comfortable <laughs> explaining uh, what actually goes on here. But, um, but as usual, you know, they, they have a wonderful succinct description that I, I'm not gonna be able to improve on. Uh, so I'm just gonna read that. Local regression is a different approach for fitting flexible nonlinear functions, okay? So that's basically the topic of this chapter. But uh, here we have, which involves computing the fit at a target point x sub o or x naught uh, using only the nearby training observations. Okay, and I really like, I really, really like uh, the diagram they have for this. Um, so what you see is uh, um, the, these sort of got this, this bell curve, right? I'm gonna, use, I'm gonna look at the second panel because it's, it's fully, you know, the bell curve is, is fully there. Oh, it's fine, it doesn't matter. But you see that, um, so there's the, the target point. So there's the x, x naught corresponds to, to that x value. And you actually perform a regression of y on to x using only the orange points. So you're not, so that's why it's, it's local. Um, and it's local in the second sense that not only are you only using those orange points, you're using them to the degree that they are close to, to x naught. So what that this curve corresponds to is the weights in a weighted least squares regression. So for example, this point over here, or these points over here, basically have weight zero. So they're kind of trailing off. And these, I mean, definitely, the strictly completely zero, not even to a precision error. These blue points have, have zero weight in the regression. Is there a cutoff, so, like the, uh, the lowest weight gets rounded down to zero, like from going from orange to blue? Is there a standard yeah. for this? You know, because a, a bell curve technically doesn't have a cutoff. Yeah, so um, that is a, a good question. I know that, well, let, let me come back to it in one second. Um, because, so this is the way they present the algorithm in the book and I'm trying to think about how, I've, I found it enlightening, but in light of time constraints, I'm not sure. 
I'm going to just point at one specific element. Um, so it, it's, well, okay. The first one is pretty important because whenever you fit these models, you have to decide on what span to use. So here we have S. So you might use span 0.5, which would mean that you use half of your data. So half of the points would be orange. So here, if I had to eyeball this, you know, it's maybe, maybe a third, right? So there's a span of 0.33. I'm just throwing that out there. That's what that would be. So you have your in number of uh, points in your data set. K would be, you know, uh, if you had 9,000, sorry, if you had 999, you'd have 333. If you're doing this like third, 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 uh, and then your, your fraction would be uh, whatever. Okay. That'd be yes. But what I, to answer your question, uh, Jonathan, what I wanted to say was um, that they have the second step. So do you assign a, so you have this weighting function that takes in uh, basically other points that are not X naught. Uh, and then, so this K assigns a weight to these K nearest neighbors. And that's the phrase they actually use. Throw back. So um, such that the point, so, so again, so we, we are considering points within a certain span, but it says we assign a weight to them, the ones that are in this neighborhood, such that the point furthest away from X naught has weight zero. Now, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Like, why, why is it in the neighborhood if you're going to assign it a weight zero? But uh, that's what, that, that is not a mistake. That is something that I checked a few times and that actually appears in the book. So that's the extent of my knowledge is what I read there. And it looks like the way, at least in this notation, there's the, maybe that's the kernel K, like they can use other things besides Gaussians and that might just be a, you know, a choice, right? Exactly, yeah, the K, the K is a choice. Uh, so yeah, that's exactly right. That's a weeding function that the, the researcher can, can choose. And I think Gaussian is, is the norm, but, uh, but yeah. Um, oh, Unintended. No, Latex air uh, down there, but anyway, but so yeah, so then there's a weighted least squares regression and, and blah, 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 but we need to move on. Um, uh, I think this is one of the more important or interesting things uh, is that it can work with more than one explanatory variable at a time. So instead of fitting a line, you fit a surface and I'll, I'll show that in a second. Um, <clears throat> so um, this is really just to show you that we're doing the same type of thing. We're fitting a curve uh, to some points. And, you know, in every case, we can determine effective degrees of freedom and determine how wiggly it is. Notice, interestingly, uh, I mean, I think it's interesting, I don't know, that it's much, the when you have a short span, it's much more jagged uh, than uh, when you have a high degrees of freedom in the, for example, smoothing spines. I think that's interesting, um, but you may remember uh, there are, when we did K nearest neighbors and you set K really low, uh, you had really jagged decision boundaries. And so here we're also determining uh, sort of how many span determines basically how many neighbors are used in determining the fit at a given point. So that, that's interesting. Um, let's see, in RO, oh, uh, this was interesting. So, you know, here, here's some uh, historical temperature data. Um, and I think I, I wanted to, to show you this because you may have been doing local regression more than you, you realize. So anytime you use GeoSmooth or, or StatSmooth in ggplot, um, you're probably using low S. Um, and so here are just some different spans, span two, five, eight. Um, and so that's what this does. But so here, I actually had to specify to use low S because of this. Uh, I really should have made this into bite-sized chunks. Well, I'm just gonna highlight what I wanted to give. Uh, so stat low S is used when you have fewer than a thousand observations. Otherwise, you actually are using a general additive model uh, when you use geom or stat smooth. Um, and if you're curious why, we have anecdotally low S gives a better appearance, um, but is, Omega in two in memory, so it it just it uh, is less efficient for memory. So uh, I thought that was that was interesting. So yeah, so smooth functions in stat smooth. Anyway, uh, again, moving on swiftly. Um, 
this is what a, so if you, and by the way, this, I, I, I could have mentioned earlier, you can also do the same thing for, for splines that you, you wrap, you wrap them in, uh, so for here, here it's a, it's a, it's a local regression, but, uh, you know, for that, there's the S or NS functions to generate splines, smooth splines, natural splines, uh, and you can create two-dimensional surfaces, uh, sorry, three-dimensional surfaces, yeah, um, here, and that's kind of what this, this looks like. Um, you have to use this Akima package, and this is from the lab. Um, but so that's what that would like you fit a year age surface um, and regress wage onto it. And another very practical thing is if you're trying to use, so, so there are two packages for fitting GAMs. One is GAM, that's uh, Trevor Hasty's package. Hasty, Trevor Hasty, Trevor Hasty. Um, and then there's the MGCV package. And uh, just FYI, that those are both out there. And you might accidentally have both loaded. And <laughs> this, this did happen to me. I accidentally fit one with MGCV, thinking I was fitting with GAM. And then uh, the plot function didn't work because they both also have sort of their proprietary uh, plotting functions. Um, and uh, that's just a factor variable. So it's not that interesting. There was an error that uh, was mysterious but uh, it's gonna have to remain a mystery. Uh, so, so at this point, generalized additive models are actually nothing really new. It's just what simple linear regression is to multiple linear regression. That's sort of what uh, everything we did before was to the general, generalized additive model. Um, so <clears throat> it's basically this, it's taking Y, representing Y as an intercept plus, uh, different functions of the different independent variables. Um, and you'll notice that there are plus signs between each one of those, and that's what makes them additive. Um, so when people talk about the pros, the pros and cons of these models, one is that you do get these nice nonlinear functions for the variables individually. But at the same time, um, well, and here's kind of the, the mix of pro and con, they're very, intelligible models in that you can actually plot out the partial effect of each independent variable independent of all the others because of the, the additivity. But that's also the downside is that if you do actually think, if you have good reason to think, that, to scroll back up, there's some kind of complex interacting surface uh, that describes a relationship, or the, the joint relationship in this case of year and age on wage, then uh, that will not be captured unless you manually um, add some interactions, which of course is, is not that bad. So uh, in any case, um, so the first game they fit in the book is uh, explaining wage by the function of year, age, and education. Um, so, you know, well, okay. And uh, just to kind of bring the lab into this at the same time, um, and also point out something interesting is that depending on what functions you use to expand the variables, you can actually fit these uh, with just OLS. Um, so you just, so in this case, for example, they have a natural spline with four degrees of freedom for a year with five degrees of freedom for age and then include education uh, as a factor variable. And, and you may remember uh, if you use plot on a linear, uh, a linear model object, you usually get a residuals plot but you can use plot.gam, and I think that you should maybe be capitalized. Um, you can actually get these nice partial effect plots. And this is what people mean when they say that it's still intelligible, that GAMs are, are, are more intelligible than other more complex nonlinear models. It's because you can still see, okay, like, you know, here's the effect of age on wage. Uh, you know, it has this squiggly thing, but I can think about the effect of age independent of year and independent of education. Okay, um, but when you start using smoothing splines, um, you need to use a GAM function. Again, it can either be from uh, the, the Trevor Hasty's uh, package or it can be from MGCV. <laughs> I can't tell the difference, man. Yeah, so they actually have pretty similar effects here. Uh, I was actually 
worried that I was like going colorblind or some like inverse colorblind and noticing differences in color that don't exist because uh, these look exactly the same. Despite the fact, again, that these are both natural splines, uh, this is a smoothing spline, and this is a local regression. So that was uh, that was interesting. Uh, I had this section on backfitting and partial residuals. Uh, it's pretty pretty cool. Um, there's a problem from the book that I actually just copied in here that just to show you stuff, uh, and it it was pretty wild to me, uh, but. Um, I encourage you to check out problem 11 from chapter seven. It's easy to remember, 7-Eleven. Um, <clears throat> I definitely would encourage that. Um, let's see, what else do I wanna say? Um, I still have 10 minutes. Um, no, I think, I think, I think, <laughs> GAMs are really not, I mean, once you, you've understood basis functions and splines to your satisfaction, GAMs are not, uh, you know, I'm not that different. Um, yeah, plot yeah, that should have had a capital G. Um, so just, you know, how do you work with these in R? Um, you, uh, again, you can use the linear models and use the same uh, uh, formula notation. And then you get these partial effect plots. That's, that's nice. Um, not your grandmother's residual plot, there it is. Um, one, I think this, this is probably the last thing I, I talk about. Uh, one thing that I like, and this is both part of um, the GAM packages output and the MGCV packages output, is that you can do things like this. So here notice we have three models being fit. All of them have the same outcome variable. What's different is the representation of year. So in the first one, there is a year doesn't appear. In the first one, it appears as a linear term. And in the last one, in the third model, it appears as a smooth spline uh, with four degrees of freedom. Um, so these are nested models. They have nested complexities. So that means that you can put them uh, in an ANOVA uh, and you know, see if sort of the benefit of uh, an explained variance is worth the uh, degrees of freedom that get they get taken up basically. Uh, and you see, you can do tests like this where you see, okay, so, you know, adding year to my variable, to my model of wage uh, was just, was worth it. Very significant at the alpha equals 0 0.05. But, um, you know, adding it as a spline instead of a, just a straight line uh, was not significant anyway at alpha is 0 0.05. Uh, five. And so that's how, that's one way you can test for nonlinear, uh, a nonlinear relationship in this case between wage and year after having control for age and education. Um, so that, that's, that's nice. And you can actually get these, uh, you can come to similar conclusions uh, with the summary output. So if you do summary on a model fit either with GAM or MGCV, um, you get a similar table with MGCV. You get this ANOVA for parametric effects. So that's the, the linear contribution of the terms. And you also get this ANOVA for non-parametric effects. And so here again, we see that year should be included uh, in the model, that. but that that it is non-significant as a non-parametric as a as a wiggly effect. <laughs> it sounds silly to say wiggly. In any case, uh, I, I don't. If, it's good that I kind of am running out of time because I uh, I don't have anything specifically for MGCV, but it's very similar. I mean, literally, uh, formula input. It's the function is called GAM. Um, I will say the documentation for MGCV is very nice. Um, so I kind of got lost in that for a second uh, yesterday. And for tidy models, uh, it's actually, there's really no documentation yet, but from what I understand, it exists. There is, there is a way to fit it, um, fit generalized additive models, but so far um, the documentation is, is completely bare. So I think- so just Justin, I was actually playing around with the tidy models for GAM because I was at, going through the guide, you know, for the lab. 
And you can't, as far as I can tell, you can't use a workflow object with it. You can do it using Parsnip. Um, and let me, I'll have to just copy that code and put, paste it in the, um, in the Slack channel. I, I'm not sure that I did it right, but I certainly got <laughs> some kind of something back. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not, I was a little disappointed that we couldn't do like the workflow and I wasn't quite clear based on the documentation of like how to tune parameters exactly. It seemed like maybe you could, maybe you couldn't, maybe I just didn't understand what, what the documentation was saying. So I'll, I'll put that in the Slack channel and people can comment or, you know, edit whatever you want to do. Yeah, well, that would, I mean, I think if you were to do that, then we, there would be a, just an increase in the world's, uh, like a very noticeable, a sizable increase in the world's documentation for tiny models, generalized additive models, because it's, it's pretty bare. It, it is. I was kind of surprised. I had to, like the searches just didn't come up with many things at all. Then finally I found something in the documentation that was sort of helpful. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that is the end for me. So I'd appreciate uh, anyone to just drop any wisdom in the last five minutes. That'd be great. I don't have any wisdom to drop, but I, I, wanted to point out that no one has signed up yet for chapter eight. Um, so if someone would like to do that, that would be cool. Uh, if not, we'll figure it out. So, um, yeah, anyone have any other thoughts about seven? I have just like uh, in the four minutes we have left, just something for discussion. The span, and to be honest, it's been like a couple of weeks since I read chapter seven, so I may have forgotten. The span, so let me, okay, there I am. <laughs> I'm thinking in terms of linear algebra, right? You know, where you think about a span, like, like does something span R3 or whatever. How would we think about that in terms of, you know, these models? Anybody have any thoughts? You mean like which models span, which space of models spans another space, like which ones overlap? Yeah, well, I, I'm thinking, obviously this span has to do with the degrees of freedom, right? I have to go back and look at the notes, like I said. But um, my, my intuition says there's a reason why that word was used. And I, obviously we know we can represent linear models in like matrix form, you know? So that's, I'm just throwing that out there. I haven't really fleshed through all this or, in my mind or read through the relevant passages again. And I don't remember the if there is a specific um, formula for span, um, but yeah, I'm just throwing that out there. My, my intuition is that, that, that they're not the same span. Uh, because so, so, so span, if, for example, for local regression is given by where like span equals k divided by n. So the number of okay, neighbors gotcha. you're considering divided by the size of the, the data set. So again, so if you're using, if you have a thousand points, you're using, you want a span of 0.5, you'd use 500. Okay, so maybe I'm overthinking this. I wasn't sure if that S was span or something else. Um, I must have missed that, but that, that makes sense, I guess. Yeah, no, just to briefly bring this back up. Um, so for example, for local regression, when you when you write, for example, stat smooth, right? Um, and then you specify span as 0.2, right? So I, I'm i pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that that means that for, so which one was this? This is blue, like that. So at each point you're using, you know, one fifth of the data, right? Whereas for example, for this uh, slightly more wriggly, wiggly red one you're using half and for this one for the uh, golden line you're using uh, 80 percent of the data so that that's what I think span is here it's actually much it's about nearest neighbors really okay that okay that, that makes that makes a lot more sense than I do think I was overthinking it so thank you well thank you but I could be wrong but I'm I'm pretty sure that that is right